So, Dr. Nofong, please take over. Um, thank you, HOD. Um, we'll proceed with the first thing that we are supposed to have for the morning. Um, Engineer Bwachi, please, can you take over? I'll stop sharing so that you can take over, and if you are presenting, you would um, share that for us. All right, good morning, everyone. And I trust you're all good this morning. So to begin with, um, I'm sure you agree with me if we can all agree to some um, guidelines that will help all of us. In the course of the discussion, if you have any question, you can please um, take a piece of paper and write them down, or you can use a chat room feature to put those questions across so that the moderator will take notes so that when appropriate, your questions can be addressed. Also, we would like to also encourage all that if you decide to want to put your video on, please look in your background and look at your environment to see if it's appropriate to do so, so that your background does not distract other students or other friends from benefiting from the program. Thank you very much. So as you have already uh, been told, um, this morning myself and my team are here with you. And beginning with me, um, I want to tell you some bits about Ghana Civil Aviation Authority, um, a department called the Air Traffic Safety Engineering, and our operations. But before I continue, Dr. Vincent Nofong, can you please confirm you can hear me loud and clear? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. All right. So as you can see on the screen, I want to tell you about air traffic safety. So as the name depicts, air traffic safety, it definitely has to do with the air, open air. It also has to do with traffic, and it also has to do with safety. So as you can see in the picture, um, this has to do with a company called Zoom Airlines Limited. And to them, safety means it is safe to fly. But then if you look at the aircraft at the background, you may notice that there's a dripping oil on the floor. And you may also notice that it appears one of the ties has come off. Well, as we continue, you may get more understanding towards this. What are we going to discuss this morning? First, we're going to talk about some overview of Ghana Civil Aviation Authority, the air traffic safety engineering operations. And under the air traffic safety operations, there are three main major areas that we are much concerned with. The communication systems, the navigation systems, and the surveillance systems. And of course, we have time to have discussions with you, friends. Now, Ghana Civil Aviation Authority was enacted by an act mainly to provide safety oversight. So to Ghana Civil Aviation, all that they are concerned with is safety. And of course, our motto is safety and security, which is our priority. A lot of people don't really um, heard much about Ghana Civil Aviation or what we do. In fact, Ghana Civil Aviation Authority owns the whole of airports. And in, 19, in 2006, by a law, Ghana Civil Aviation Authority gave birth to a new company called Ghana Airports Company. So if you have heard of Ghana Airports Company Limited, it is Ghana Civil, uh, Ghana Civil Aviation's only begotten company. Why was this company formed? Mainly to take care of the ground operations of the airport so that civil aviation can concern itself with provide safety oversight and 
air navigation systems. But as we speak now, Ghana Civil Aviation Authority is like a referee and a player. It has its two main functions, safety, oversight, and air navigation services. So very soon, these two major functions will be de further decoupled so that we, Ghana Civil Aviation Authority will stay to provide this safety oversight. And then a new Sun company will be given birth called the Air Navigation Services. So this is an opportunity for most of you friends to work hard so that you may have the opportunity to be employed in this new organization. And of course, it will also leave holes in Ghana Civil Aviation Authority to employ more. We have so many departments under the Ghana Civil Aviation Authority. Notable, we can talk about the air traffic control and air traffic engineering. But in this morning, I want to tell you about the air traffic engineering operations. What is the air traffic safety engineering operations mandated to do? It's to provide safety oversight in the Accra flight information region and basically to do so using uh, providing communication systems, navigation systems and surveillance systems. How can this be achieved? Well, it is achieved with other operations under air traffic engineering. So under air traffic engineering, the main focus is the communication, the navigation, and the surveillance sections. But other sections also include the maintenance planning, the electrical maintenance, training, research, and development, and workshop and calibration. So this, as you see on the screen, are auxiliary, uh, means providing support for the main sections, communication, navigation, and surveillance. Let me whet your appetite on this discussion. Sorry, I was not able to capture this screen very well, but the communication, navigation, and surveillance, what is this basically to achieve? Well, it's to help one aircraft from one point to another point, from one point to the other point. Now, let's discuss this picture from picture one to picture eight. And this has to do with phases of flight. That's to do with phases of flight. So now you see in picture one, an aircraft is parked. And then at the top of picture one, you will see a certain man in a room holding a walkie-talkie. And just beneath him, you see a small box, probably a radio unit. So before a pilot even kickstart the engine, he needs permission from this man at the top here called the air traffic controller to give him permission to put on his engine. It is also required that before a pilot puts on his engine, he has a long checklist that he goes through. After everything successfully, he puts on his engine. And then when he's ready to fly, he uses the taxi way onto the tarmac so in the taxiway you know the aircrafts are parked at the airports are places we call the apron so from the apron there are adjoining roads that leads to the main road that the planes take off so those adjoining roads that leads to the main road that the plane take off are called the taxiways so the aircraft will taxi and then get gets to the main place it takes off that we call the runway so example, um, in Accra, our runway length is 3.8 kilometers, but from threshold to threshold, it is 3.6 kilometers long. So the aircraft gets to the runway and then it will take off by climbing, as we see in, in picture um, four. But at this point, Friends, it will surprise you or it will interest you to know that communication systems, navigation systems, and surveillance systems are all employed from parking, taxi, takeoff, climb. Now the aircraft will climb to a height 
And at that height, question, how can this aircraft get help? Well, you see something at the top of picture five, we call the radar, R-A-D-A-R, acronym for radio detection and ranging, which we will soon talk about. By means of this radar, an air traffic controller who is sitting on his desk on a single screen can see the whole of Ghana flight information region. And very soon, you have a pictorial view of Ghana air flight information region. So from the air traffic controller single screen, he sees every moving aircraft in our airspace. And by means of the radar also, we see other things that I will soon talk to you about. And then the pilot who is getting help from the air traffic controller is able to climb to a certain height, get help by means of the navigation systems, get to talk to the pilot by means of the communication systems, and to be seen by means of the surveillance systems. So he flies through the open air, that is the cruising height, and then when he makes a decision that he wants to descend to touch down, he, by means of the communication navigation systems, so from this point onwards, if you will permit me, I will mention three words, C and S. So anytime I mention C and S, please note that C for communication, N for navigation, and S for surveillance. So this aircraft descends, and then in picture seven, you will notice a picture at the top that we call the VOR. It is a navigation equipment. By means of this navigation equipment, the pilot who is flying the plane is able to know his relative location and where exactly for him to pass to know how to get to the runway of the um, approaching um, airport. And whilst he gets his bearing, another navigation equipment as seen in picture eight will guide him to land. So planes don't just touch down, they receive guidance. They receive guidance in order to touch down exactly at the center of the runway and they also receive guidance as to which angle for them to touch down. You know, planes, when they are landing, they are gliding. They are gliding because it's like you see the nozzle of the plane a little bit up and then the ties down. So they are like a, like a 45 degrees angle. So they are gliding. So they are, they are helped with an angle that they will touch down. With this nice explanation on the phases of the flight, how are the CNS systems able to um, communicate with um, the aircraft? Of course, we make use of the electromagnetic spectrum. Electromagnetic spectrum. And in the electromagnetic spectrum is a range of radio frequencies from which communication, navigation, surveillance equipments are designed for um, for uh, information interchange. But of course, we are from the very low frequency to the extra high frequency. Most of you friends are quite familiar with VHF, UHF, because most TV broadcasting lies in VHF, FM transmission lies in the VHF band, FM band 88 megahertz, 108 megahertz lies in the VHF band. So TV broadcast lies between the VHF and UHF. So those of you who like watching TV, if you try scanning, you will see that it will toggle between VHF and goes to HF. Sorry, UHF. And to the engineering students among us, you may have seen this electromagnetic spectrum but might be wondering, how is its practical use? Or is it just some table we always need to commit to memory? Friends, this table is actually very easy to commit to memory. If you take notes of the frequency range, you will notice a certain trend, and I'll be glad those who have unmuted their microphone to kindly mute their microphone, please. You only unmute if you have been given a chance to ask a question. Otherwise, please mute your microphone so we don't have we have less um, distractions. All right. Now, if you look at the frequency range table, for instance, you will notice a certain trend: a trend of three to thirty, thirty to three hundred, three hundred to three, three to thirty, thirty to three hundred. 
300 to 3, 3 to 30, 30 to 300. And as you move up, it moves from kilohertz, kilo is 1,000. So from 1,000 to 1 million. 1 million is megahertz. Yes, um, please, those who smile from uh, any of the co-hosts or the hosts, can you please take and be muting um, our friends who mis uh, forgetfully or mistakenly unmute themselves? Thank you. So if you got the clue, it's so easy to remember this electromagnetic spectrum. And then you will notice that in the HF, in the HF band, we talk about amateur radio, shape accident communication, shortwave broadcasting, and then in the VHF also, we talk about FM broadcasting, television broadcasting, amateur radio, aeronautical radio. And if you go to UHF also, we also talk about what? Aeronautical radio. And of course, um, our communication satellite systems also lies in the super high frequency band for space communication satellite broadcasting weather reader so in, av in, in the aviation industry for cns systems especially the communication systems one of the most important frequency to us is the hf and i will explain to you very soon why now if you look on the next screen in this picture it talks about total airport solutions now remember i mentioned to you that the runway of accra is um 3.8 kilometers now if you look on the screen you the far right just a second all right so I'm sure you can see my mouse on the screen, right? Okay, just a second. Now, if you can see from here, if you can see on the right side, on the right side of the aeroplane, you will see the runway, what we call the runway. Now, you will see that there's a portion where it looks like a zebra crossing. So from where the zebra crossing is and to the other end where the zebra crossing end is the active runway, which in the case of Accra is 3.6 kilometers. And then if you look on this picture I mean, critically, all the systems we are going to talk about can be seen here. So, for instance, on the left of the, round of the aircraft, you will see some antennas on the left. You will see marked marker beacon. This helps aircrafts in getting their um, actual confirmation if on they are on the right path towards the, uh, the runway. Now, the glide slope DAB, RVR, DME, the AOS, VOR, DME. Um, so you will see that all these systems I mentioned and around here are navigation systems. Now you also see here MLAT, ADSB, um, they are surveillance systems. But the communication systems you don't find here because behind the scenes, it helps air traffic controllers to communicate with the pilots in the air. What then do we mean when you talk about the communication systems? Well, it includes the VHF radios, the voice, please, the person who has unmuted, can you kindly mute? Thank you. The VCCS systems, the HF radios, the microwave links, the VSAT links, the AMHS or AFTN, and the audio video recorders. So VHF for very high frequency radios, voice communication systems, 
higher frequency radios, microwave links, very small aperture terminal networks, automatic message handling systems, and then audio video recorders. So let's see whether we can talk about them in brief. So the next screen shows you a picture of the voice communication control systems. So as you can see in the picture, an engineer on the, using the left hand is touching on the panel. On this panel includes an integration of the VHF, the HF, the TSRX. In fact, this voice communication control systems controls and connects together the various voice communication systems that are used in the air traffic management systems. So in here, we have a number of the communication systems integrated into it. So the VHF, the transmitter receivers, the telephone network. So as you look on your right, is a telephone network called the PABX and other ATC communication systems have all been integrated here. So from here, from a central point, the engineers are able to monitor exactly what is on the panels of the air traffic controllers, which you will soon see in the picture. So the voice communication control systems, we say, provides an interconnected chain and backbone for numerous interfaces acting as an ex exchange for all the interfaces put together. Of course, because it's interconnecting other systems, what it works, of course, on various IT protocols customized for each set facility and that is where you friends computer science students comes in you are well versed with the communication protocols so all these protocols makes it possible being it at the logical or physical because connecting physically has to do with the level two the logical configuration has to do with layer one so all this takes place to help all these systems to be able to be integrated so this touch panel that the engineer was touching is as seen on the screen So this picture was taken only last Friday and at exactly 12.21. Uh, it's not too clear, otherwise we would have seen all these uh, frequencies that I'm talking about. So please, let's relax and watch this short video. So if you did took notice, you may have realized that whilst the air traffic control so the voice you heard in the back, background is a communication between an air traffic controller in fact an approach controller and an aircraft ethiopian aircraft that it was just about um finding its way towards landing in accra airport so on the top left just under the time 12 27 on the left you may have noticed that there was a black arrow one inch showing up and one showing down so when the air traffic controller wants to communicate he's transmitting once he's transmitting the arrow shows up and then when the pilot is communicating back to the controller the arrow on the left points down for, to let us know that the path to receive the signal from the pilot is also clear And now, look on the next screen and watch this other video. Sorry. Sorry. 
So that's just 571. Good afternoon, proceed. I did pre flight level 400. Uh, so what you are seeing is the, the flight information region of Ghana, Accra, or Ghana. So these are live videos as at home. That's how the, uh, the time is on the screen. Taking from the air traffic control center. So this black is the black of Ghana. And then that vast black line you see going down is the sea. Is the sea. Take the watch again. Watch again. All these black spots here you are seeing is the sea. So, uh, Togo is here. Uh, Porto is here. Nigeria is here. All these black spots you are seeing here is all part of Ghana. We control. So, all this vast land, three from here, 370 kilometers into the sea, is all part of our airspace. So, this is the map of Ghana. Togo Benin is here, Nigeria is here, Gabon is here, Sao Tome is even part of our airspace. So all these vast... So that's green you are seeing this is actual airport. And those lines you are seeing on the screen are logical roads up in the sky. They are not physical. Now this is a VCCS. Now you see the black arrow down. Means the, uh, see, this arrow down here means we are receiving from the aircraft, and arrow means that the controller is communicating with the aircraft. So, this workbench here is for um, approach controller. Aircraft within 20 nautical miles get to land is handed over to this uh, controller here, and all those green green dots you are seeing are. Uh, if, and this is um, um, read, uh, VCCS approach? systems to integrate uh, all the communication right. systems yeah. 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 to Black Star 172 yeah. so, Black Star 170 is African World it's about to land it and friends, if you had come to Ghana Civil Aviation Authority you yeah. may not have had the privilege yeah. to see this place it's a secured area so thank God you are able to see it in picture now all those you see, saw in the video now let's talk about them one by one now you see on the screen the vhf systems the very high frequency systems now if you remember the very high frequency systems i told you um remember the uh, the range from 30 megahertz to um, 300 megahertz and the band for fm lies within 88 108 megahertz so out of this frequency we are able to get our fm transmissions for us to enjoy isn't it but within the same frequencies especially between 10 um, between um, uh, 108 to 118 megahertz it's used a lot in the aviation industry we use them for our navigation systems and we use them for our communication systems now this uh, the what you see in the picture here are some of the systems for the VHF communication. So on the left are some of the frequencies. So if you look closely, you see 119.5 megahertz. 119.5 megahertz is the frequency or the carrier that the uh, uh, approach controller will use to communicate with aircraft. So, but when the aircraft is not coming to land, or uh, sorry, when the aircraft is uh, within um, 30 to between 10 to 30 nautical miles, because he wants to land or he's taken off between 10 to 30 nautical miles, he's handed over to this approach controller who communicates with him on 1195 megahertz. In order not to confuse him, when he's within 10 nautical miles to touch down at the airport or leave the airport, is handed over to a controller we call tower controller but when he is beyond the 30 nautical miles in um, climbing and gets to cruise it means he's um en route he's handed over if he's at the northern south if he's at the northern side of Accra FIR we communicate with him on frequency one two um one two six point six megahertz and if one to six point five megahertz, and yes, one to six point seven megahertz, and if the aircraft 
is coming if it's flying down of Ghana towards the sea and you want to communicate with him we communicate in film on one uh, one three zero dot nine megahertz but then you see vhf systems if you look at this higher frequency that works on by line of sight remember the relationship of uh, v um, uh, uh, the frequency the relationship between frequency and distance is that the higher the frequency, the shorter the distance. And by that, it means the VHF has a limited range. And by that, it also means that VHF will always work best if you have a physical transmitter and a physical receiver installed on LAD to be able to communicate seamlessly. But Ghana, the distance between Ghana to Tamale, let's assume it's about 600 kilometers. And by land, we can install VHF systems and it will work perfectly. Now, remember, I mentioned that the C portion we control, it's 370 kilometers. It means our VHF systems will only work to a certain portion. Beyond, our VHF system will not work there. How will it work? How would we be able to communicate? Well, we are able to do that using the HF systems. But before that, this is a typical um, rack of the VHF system. A typical rack of the VHF systems. And our computer science students are happy because they are seeing servers, eh? Yes, especially on the left. This service on the left houses our integrated ATM surveillance systems. And of course, our voice video recorders, they are all in here. Every single communication you had between the pilot and the controller, it's recorded by audio and it's recorded by video for accident and investigation purposes. So as you see in the right, red arrow, this houses the communication systems. Now, beyond the point where we cannot communicate with the VHF systems, what next? But remember, even with the VHF systems in Ghana, it is not only Accra Airport we have. We also have Sunyani, as you can see on the screen. We have Sunyani at the top, Tamale in the middle, and Kumasi down. So every communication between controllers and pilots taking off place in Sunyani, Tamale, and Kumasi, even in as well as they recording locally, we also record their communication in Accra. And through um, protocol configurations using the VSAT and the MPLS, we are also able to um see the systems as um shown on the screen so as at the time we i took this picture you may have noticed that there's a red indication in the recorder in tamale it means the system that does the recording in tamale had an issue but um it was resolved though but i just took this picture for you to appreciate that we are able to monitor and see in real time if problems that happen that even when the engineers don't even see it we are able to see it and notify them to resolve quickly now beyond areas where our vhf cannot work we make use of the hf systems the hf systems the racks are just like what you saw in the vhf but this picture have seen use a typical screen of the vhf server so the VHF server uh, connected to the rack um, on a, on a uh, monitor screen, um, we are able to see. So if you look at where this big arrow is, uh, if it's not too clear, but later on, if you get the notes, you may notice HF1 and HF2. So at the oceanic area where communication to pilot controllers is not possible by VHF, we use HF. And HF the bandwidth is 3 um, megahertz to 30 megahertz if you compare 3 megahertz to 30 megahertz as against vhf 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz which has a bigger bandwidth of course it's vhf so it means if the relationship of higher frequency to shorter distance 
Now, if you come to HF, you will realize that the frequency is not as big as VHF. So HF has the advantage to be propagated in long distances. So with HF, we are able to go far. We are able to go far. Now, if you look in the next picture, this is the map of Ghana. And all this portion down here, you see that red line going down to another continent down here? That is Sao Tome. So all planes down here, planes down here, we are able to see. Um, just a second. All right. So down here, you look at the map of Ghana. Down the map of Ghana is an open sea. So planes within 370 kilometers down here, we see, and we use the HF to communicate with them. But the big disadvantage of HF is that since it has a smaller frequency, it means the bandwidth required is less. And because the bandwidth requirement is less, it means that there's a lot of noise when you communicate of HF. But with modern technology and design, we've been able to overcome this. So in some areas where it is still very grainy and noisy to communicate with the pilots, well, we use a technology in conjunction with the surveillance system called the CPDLC, Controller Pilot Data Link Control Protocol. It is just like a, a, the WhatsApp we have on our phone. So, um, I don't know what other picture exists. Otherwise, in the previous picture, you may have noticed that the controller will be clicking on the screen and a window will open that has a series of program commands and the controller, instead of telling him, climb to this height, he will send him a text message. And then from the text message, he able, he's able to understand exactly what is required of him to do. Now, from the VHF systems, so by far, what have we said about the HF and the VHF systems? The VHF communication systems and the HF systems basically helps the controller to be able to communicate with the pilots. I'm sure that point has been well established. Another communication system is the AMHS, Automatic Message Handling System. Now you see, as you see on the map, you can clearly see the map of Ghana. And you see that down here, uh, somewhere in Accra, that looks like a hub. From there, there are a number of lines going up. It's showing you the number of countries that Accra is connected to. And you notice that all our neighbors we are connected to. We are connected to right Togo, Benin, Nigeria. We are connected to, on the left, Ivy Coast. We see Burkina. We see Mali. We even come here, we connected to Sao Tome. We connected to Brazzaville. We are connected to Gabon. So the green lines you are seeing means that we have an existing infrastructure and the connection is true. And the red line you are seeing shows that either the infrastructure there has been removed or faulty. But I can confidently tell you that apart from Angola that we have a problem with, the other rates you are seeing up there is because the infrastructure at those places have been removed. That is why they are showing red. Now, the automatic message handling system, what exactly is it doing? Basically, what it's doing is that before a plane takes off from Accra, we need to send information regarding what type of aircraft how many people are on the aircraft? What route is the aircraft passing? How much fuel is it having? How many people are on board the aircraft? What is the registration of the aircraft? Just as cars have registration numbers, aircraft also have registration numbers. So we give information to all the neighboring countries, tell them that this plane will be taking off in Accra at this time. 
be expecting it in your airspace at this time. So we shared all this information through the satellite of VSAT network on our automatic message handling system to our neighboring system. So before the aircraft is off, they know that at this time they are expected to see an aircraft in their airspace. So for example, I am sure from Ghana, next is Togo, Benin, and of course Nigeria. So when an aircraft takes off in Accra and is flying through Nigeria, it will fly through Togo, fly through Benin before it gets to Nigeria. So before it even gets to Togo, Togo air traffic controllers are aware that an aircraft will be getting to them. But the air traffic controller will again, using the VCCS will, uh, and the, uh, the PABS telephone network, will notify the controller in Togo that an aircraft flying at this height, at this speed, at this registration, will be getting into your airspace at this time. Confirm, you can see it. He confirms and tells him, be prepared to take over and guide him. So at some point, the Accra controller will hand him over to Togo. Togo will do the same and hand him over to Benin. Benin will do the same and hand him over to Nigeria. And they'll be guiding him until he flies through their airspace, providing safety oversight. And then once he's leaving his airspace, he guides him to he sends him to the next, 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 and then he goes. So there are a lot of aircraft that fly here. You know South Africa is down here, US is somewhere here. And so most aircraft that fly to the US fly on the left towards Takrade, towards um, Ivy Coast and goes the sea here. Those coming from South Africa, it means they are flying on the sea throughout. And those who are going to Europe, you fly, you go to the north, Mali, uh, Burkina, and then up, up and through there, you see desert throughout across the Mediterranean into Europe. So the AMHS system, basically, it's able to help to send information regarding flight routing and flight planning. That's what this system um, does. Automatic message handling system or aeronautical fixed telecommunication network. Aeronautical fixed telecommunication network. So it's a network of um, this AMHS systems with other countries so that information can be shared seamlessly and it's information it's it's not just shared between our neighboring countries an aircraft like klm that is even flying to flying from amsterdam to ghana through the amhs we are able to receive flight plans of these planes before they even get to our, our, our airspace even we know when they are expected to even leave our airspace now next year is our vain sat network so at the top right, we see VSAT plus three. Very small, VSAT means very small aperture terminal. You know, VSAT, satellite communication in time pass, we have very huge dish. In fact, if you come to um, Kotoka International Airport, you will see at the base of our headquarters, very big satellite dish. But nowadays, um, because of advancements in technology, these dishes are not as huge as they are very small and for satellite communication where it employs the use of such smaller dishes we call the very small VSAT network VSAT again for very small aperture terminal now if you look on the left where the arrow is pointing if you look closely you will see Accra as the hub from Accra to the VSAT we connect to Tamale we connect so connecting to Tamale is what helps us to see what is happening in Tamale. Connect to Sunyane, we connect to Kumasi, and we also connect to Sao Tome and Principe. Down, 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 down the south. So we are able to create a tunneling backbone for us to be able to connect to them and to share their AMHS information and to also extend our VHF communication systems. Now, on our VSAT network, so this network you saw here, typically, this is the screen to confirm to us the ones that are working. So, as at the time this picture was taken, there were some maintenance ongoing where the red indications are. But then, question, show the VSAT network fail? Does that mean we will not have a means to connect? We have. We have fiber as a backbone 
that we have subscribed through Vodafone, through MPLS configuration that we connect to all these remote side stations, 16 countries that I made mention of. So although they are red because of maintenance, through the fiber network, we are able to still have connectivity with them. So as you see, Terminal 10. In this picture here, you see Accra 10, Accra. So this shows that this is the hub at Terminal 10, Accra. And that is the primary network, and it's online. The remaining systems we are here to talk about are the microwave links. So the microwave links basically provide connectivity between our transmitters and the receivers. So our transmitting antennas and receiving antennas are not located at the airport. Our transmitting antennas are located at cantonments, and our receiving antennas are located at uh, Medina, at a place called Enquantanan. So the controllers at the airport press to talk. The, the ones they speak through the VHF, there is a system at the top that send the signals to cantonments and with the transmitting antennas at cantonments the signal goes to the planes and they hear when the pilots are speaking to the controllers their voice goes to Medina, and through these microwave links it comes to the airport and the controllers hear them so in the video the communication was going on in real time and it was as if everything is at a single place but no through the microwave links we have our transmitting and receivers specially displays, uh, set apart to prevent um, interferences and to employ uh, to gain its economic benefits as i mentioned the audio video recorders that are also located in the last rack here records every communication between pilot controller and of course on the controller screen the big screen you saw every command they issue there is also recorded and this brings us to a close of the communication systems. Now, we, let's talk about the navigation systems. The navigation systems. Um, so, at this point, uh, it's 9.45 and as someone, uh, as I used to say, uh, when I was a student, once I see news on the screen, we say that it is time for news because the uh, instructor will be reading the news on the screen. So, um i know you have the information on the screen so maybe for the purpose of those um who want to see whether my reading is good or not let me give it a try and do a little reading so the air navigation systems are vital in international civil and military aviation and we say pilots depend on the accurate operation of terrestrial navigation systems of again such as the vhf so remember I mentioned the VOR. So the VOR, the V there means VHF. O means omnidirectional. And R means radio range. So VHF, omnidirectional range. The instrument landing system, that is the ILS. The distance measuring equipment, DME. The marker beacons, which are obsolete now, to get reliable information on their actual positioning. On the actual positioning as well as for safe landing. You say air navigation systems are subject to the highest safety requirements and to ensure accurate operation and worldwide compatibility. The International Civil Aviation Organization has standardized the critical parameters for such radio navigation aids and a document called an extend volume one that talks about flight inspection organizations, regular control calibration certification and radio navigation systems are, are defined to ensure compliance with specification as stipulated by ICAO, which of course is essential for public use and it's also essential for military use. So terrestrial navigation systems, when you say talk about terrestrial, it has to do with what? Terrestrial navigation system has to do with what? ground so on the ground we have some transmitters and corresponding receivers and the aircraft also have corresponding um, receivers to receive this signal 
and an onboard computer to process the signals for them to know what exactly it means. What are some of the navigation systems? Well, it includes, notably, the VOR, which is a very VHF, um, which is very high frequency omnidirectional range. And the VOR, we have two types, the DVOR and we have the CVOR. I'll also talk about them. We have the DME, the DME, which is the distance measuring equipment. We also have the Enroute DME and we have the Terminal DME. We also talk about the ILS, which is the Instrument Landing System, which comprises of the localizer and the glide path or glide slope. We also have the Automatic Weather Observation System, simply called the AWOS, which are mainly is for purposes of use by the meteorological uh, the department so the metro uh, department actually uh, are located at the airport that provides a real-time weather information for use by the uh, pilots i will explain to you why they need such information we also have the uh, the non-directional beacons the ndb we have some in accra we have some in kumasi tamale sunyani but the ones in Tamale and Kumasi have been decommissioned, means we no longer have use for it. But the one in Sunyani is the main equipment, navigation systems in Sunyani, that lands the planes in Sunyani. So friends, those of you in Takwa, the mines also have the NDB. I'm sure once in a while you see planes flying in and out of Takwa, and you might be wondering, is there an airport? How are they able to know uh, they, are, they, are, they are bearing to come to Takwa? It is because of the NDB. So yes, um, once a while, they, they rely on us to help maintain when they are faulty, their NDBs for them. So they are able to know uh, their exact bearing and positioning when they are flying towards Takwa to know that, oh, this is the airfield we have created and that is where we have to come. So it's the NDB in Takwa that helps them. Those of you may have done attachment of uh, Anglo Gold and uh, I'm sure you may have seen this before. We also have the ATIS, Automatic Terminal Information System. Now, look on the next screen, the VOR. In Accra, if you are driving on the spin test route, it, there is a tunnel that links to East Legon. If you pass through the, uh, 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 the tunnel leading you towards East Legon, and you get to the end please don't turn left don't turn right just go straight it will send you straight to an uh, to a, a, a locked gate in there is house our VOR now this what we are seeing on the screen is the, the D type the Doppler VOR. so basically what is the function of the VOR we say that it is a radio navigation aid recommended by ICAO and introduced internationally for short and medium range aircraft guidance. It can be remote control and it can be remote monitored. Please, friends, this equipment you are seeing on the screen, if not the most, one of the most important systems in air flight. We, so by far, Communication systems are basically systems that help the controller to communicate with the pilots. Navigation systems are a group of systems that helps aircraft in moving from one place to the other through the free space to know where exactly they are. So that by means of the navigational aids, Aircraft are able to, when they take off, they are able to know their relative position, know where they are supposed to pass, get guidance as to how much distance they have as they fly. When I mention of DME, we'll do an exercise right now. So this is typically the VOR. So the VOR, as you see again on the screen, it looks like a bicycle spokes. Eh? So in the middle, it sends radio signals 360 degrees 
And this DVOR that we have in Accra can send signals up to about 370 kilometers. So aircraft about 370 kilometers away from the location of where this DVR is located are able to know what we call their bearing. So I am standing at Takwa. I want to go to um, Takrade. So a person who is born in Takwa who has never traveled before wants to now go to Takrade. Question, where do you pass before you go to um, Takrade? I'm sure you are thinking about this question, right? All right. So, first, I will locate my location on a map of Takwa, and I'll put a dot there. When I put a dot there, I'll make a, a, um, a cross. And on the cross, I will name my north, south, east, and west. You get it, right? Good. Now, I'll look at my location while I'm going to Takrade on the map and put a dot in Takrade, and I'll make my cross label north, south, east, and west. Once that is done, from where I put the dot in Takwa and where I put the dot in Takrade, I'll put a ruler and write and draw a line to meet those two dots. What have I done? Now, if you look from your Cartesian, the north, south, east, and west, relative to the one you did in Takrade, you would have known that if you want to move from Takwa to Takrade, from the Cartesian you have drawn, an angle will be made. And if you look at the one in Takrade, you also see that a certain angle would have been made. That angle is a bearing. And on that line that you have drawn to Takrade becomes a route for you. And that is exactly what the VOR does. So that dot here in Takrade is a location of an aircraft. He wants to move to Takrade. He doesn't know. But he knows that when he tunes to 120 degrees, 120 degrees lies between west and south. So lies between west and south. So 120 degrees west of south, he knows that it will take him exactly to Takrade. So once the pilot tunes 120 degrees, that 120 degrees becomes his route, his selected route. The moment he's on that selected route, should he be deviating left or right, there will be an indication in the aircraft telling the pilot, my friend, you are deviating. If he's going right, to tell you fly left. If he's going left, it will tell you fly right. So the functions of the VOR, we say that it gives bearing information to aircraft. Bearing. You can write this down. It gives bearing information to aircraft. Two, on a pre-selected route, in this case, 120 degrees that was selected, on that pre-selected route, it gives a fly to or a fly from indication. So when the aircraft is flying towards Takwa, uh, from, from Takwa to Takrade, because he has selected to Takrade, there is an indication to. And the moment he gets to Takrade, it means he has to select his new route. And once it's now moving away from Takrade, it changes from to to from. Another function is that we say it gives a flying to or a flying from indication to aircraft. So flying to means that this is the active route. The moment that active route ends, you get an indication flying from. It means select your next route. Question, how does the, uh, the pilot, the system knows that my distance has ended, I have to change from to to from? Answer is the DME, Distance Measuring Equipment. We will soon talk about it, DME. So, an aircraft that is take, flying from Accra to Amsterdam is flying to and from every single VOR located between Accra and Amsterdam. I'm sure you get it. So, Ghana, we have a VOR installed. Togo, Benin, um, some Burkina, Mali, going they all have their vor installed ghana hours is operating on a certain frequency so once you are on our frequency and you know that oh so if i fly zero degrees that is enough but in ghana when you choose zero degrees it will, you go this way you go this way so probably he will choose an angle that will lead him straight through burkina mali and, and up 
towards the Mediterranean. So that bearing, so it gives that bearing information to the aircraft. And once the aircraft chooses that bearing, it gives him a flying from and flying to. But that particular bearing that he has selected at the time, in this case, the 120 degrees becomes his pre-selected route. So on the pre-selected route, if you are deviating, another function of the VOR, we say it gives a fly right or a fly left indication on a pre-selected route. So on the VOR, the principle on which the VOR operates is based on the measurements of two signals, two signals of 30 hertz. One we call the 30 hertz reference and one we call the 30 hertz variable. The variable is made to, so basically if you have an oscilloscope in the lab and you input in, you, you, you inject a signal into it, the signal is actually just a dot that will be moving on the screen. But depending on the time base and how much voltage you push to the signal, the signal moves so fast that to the eye, the human eye, this signal can be what we call a sinusoidal signal, or it can be called a sawtooth or a square wave. So depending on the relationship, that is what um, you will call that signal. But in this particular case, it is just a signal, it's just a dot that we have injected uh, 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 into it a frequency of 30 hertz. One of the signal will let it stay as it is. If you compare the phase relationship of the first signal, whether 0 degrees, 1 degree, 2 degree to 360 degrees, if you compare the relationship, it is always the same. But the other second signal, the 30 hertz, we make it to move around the first signal so that at a point we will compare how much deviation between the second signal and the reference signal. The relationship comparison gives us the angle. I'm sure you've gotten the point now. Gives us that angle. So if you are comparing the reference and the variable at 30 degrees, it means that they are in phase. Both the reference and the variable are in phase. And the angle you will get is to, uh, zero degree. At a point in time, when you compare from the reference, and then you see that the variable has uh, has moved away, has deviated, and you compare the first relationship, then you would have noticed that the angle here is 90 degree. At another instance, when you compare the variable and you see that it has directly inverted opposite as a reference, then the angle you will get is 180 degrees. And at an instance, when the um, variable is leading the reference by uh, an, at an angle, another angle, and you cross check, then you see that it's 270 degrees. So in between 0 to 90, you can always get from 1, 2, 3 to 90. And of course, 120 degrees would have lie somewhere between 90 and 180 degrees. So the VOR is the dot you are seeing on the screen. That antenna you saw is what is located here. So from here, it is sending signals from 0 to 360 degrees, and planes, aircraft pick the signals to know the which angle to fly on, just as you will see on the left, north, south, east, and west. So this plane, for instance, we say that it may be flying at an angle. It is not exactly half. It's not exactly half. So we could say that it maybe it's flying at, at angle what? Maybe 35 degrees. Maybe 35 degrees. So on this 35 degrees, once this aircraft is flying on it, this is the pre-selected route. If it's flying right or left, he gets a fly left, fly right indication. And if he's deviating, of course, it's corrected. So like I said, you see from one, from one, this aircraft is selecting the frequency of this VORA. Now you see the aircraft is changing. So it would indicate to him that to get to me, fly on this angle. So the moment he selects the frequency of this VOR station A, in the aircraft, it will indicate two. And the angle he has selected becomes his pre-selected route. And it will guide him, fly right, fly left, or it will guide him to fly exactly on that angle he has chosen until he gets here. The moment he's flying away, it will indicate from. 
The VORA here in here is also indicate it also houses a DME. That tells him the moment you select the VOR, it tells him to get to me. You need to fly this much distance to get to me. So as he's flying towards it, the distance will be reducing. Once he gets here, distance gets to zero. And that is why the sign changes from to to from. Telling this aircraft that, look, your route, if you want to go to VRB, this is a new angle. So the plane change to a new angle and you to be flying to B. It gets here, it changes to C. This is the traditional way of aircraft flying. And of course, we say that it makes this flying time rather um, far. So in the future air navigation systems, we may not really be relying on systems that are installed on the ground like this. That tells you by force, pass here, pass here. No. Aircraft should have the flexibility from number one to be able to fly directly to number two without necessarily going to B or C. But for now, in the tri-phase, we are combining. But this is the conventional way. But if you want to go directly to B, other technologies are in place. You need to have it fitted into your aircraft. Question. What if the this if this is the, the only distance between A and B, and the weather here is so bad and the aircraft cannot go? What next? The controller will guide him as with an alternative distance to be able to get to C. I'm sure you got the point. Good. So remember, at this VORA here, in here, we also have the DME also installed. So, on the server of the VOR, on the server of the VOR, so the antenna you saw, this is the pictorial of the antenna. If you want to see if any of these antennas are failing, this we know. So on this screen, you will see that all 48 antennas, in fact, these antennas on the, uh, are 48 and the one in the middle plus the one in the middle is 49 antennas. And as you see those lines moving towards this um, antennas are from the 0, 90, 180, uh, 270, 360, 0 and 360. So aircrafts gets bearing indication from this. And as you see on the right, at a glance, I know that it's my second transmitter that is working. As for my first transmitter, I tell you, my friend, sleep small. Just in case my transmitter too has a problem, then you take over and work. So in the aviation industry, we, we don't work with just one system. We always have a backup. What if I'm giving direction and all of a sudden there's a problem, it goes off. What next? Two will take off, uh, to take over. So let's turn our attention and watch a short video on VOR. So at this point, you see, he's getting to the VOR. So from here, this VOR guided him. Now he has to now fly. On his air route, he's supposed to go this way. So now he has selected a new angle, 315. He has selected a new angle, 315 degree. And so the aircraft will be turning towards 315 degree so that he can get to this VOR. And so as you may notice, why didn't he go from here to here direct? Because we have logical road which are also termed fixed points. So you see the aircraft turning. So, so you see him turning. And what you see here is the CDI, cost deviation indicator. So as it's turning, the cost deviation indicator also deflects for the pilot to know that, yes, I am on my right angle. The selected angle I have selected is correct. So the moment he is flying on top of the VOR, the sign changes from from and indicates uh, it changes from to to indicate from. You see, there was a flat. Now you see from. You see the arrow down. The arrow down shows that from. So it means he has to select his next route. 
I'm sure you get it. Now, question. How does this aircraft, how does this system know that, oh, I have to change from and to? DME comes in. The DME, which is the distance measuring equipment, has been also standardized by ICAO, which is the International Civil Aviation Authority, as a radio aid for short and medium um, distance navigation. So, this is the ground system, which is also located at the same premises of the um, VOR, or in some cases, the ILS. Now, this plane wants to know his distance. So planes, to know their distance, depending on the airspace that they are flying in, they will trigger the DME to know how far they are. So DME operates directly opposite to radar. So with the DME, it is a plane that wants to know his distance. So he will send a radio signal to the DME. DME checks the signal to see if the signal is valid and it will reply the aircraft and the aircraft to know his distance relative to the location of the DME. So if you combine the DME and the VOR, when an air, a DME is located at the VOR station, that DME is called a root DME because it is serving aircraft that is just passing their way. That is why that DME is called en route. But if the aircraft wants to know how far it is to touch down at the airport, then it has to trigger another DME that is located within the terminal of the uh, airport. That is why we have another type of DME called the terminal DME. It gives this how far you are to touch down at the terminal of the airport relative to the location where it is installed. Very soon, you will appreciate a diagram to know why, the, where, how the navigational systems are installed. So, in mathematics, remember what we used to call the rotita method called distance and bearing. Again, remember the example I gave from Takwa and Takrade. I put the dots, put my Cartesian, my north, south, east, and west. My north, south, east, and west. In Takrade, I put a dot, right, draw my Cartesian to know my north, south, east, and west. I draw a straight line from these two points. The straight line tells me based on where it is hitting and based on the Cartesian, the VOR gives the angle. Now, question. Now that I know my points from Takra to Takradi, question, what is the distance? If I want to know the distance, I take my ruler and I will measure. Once I measure, maybe I'll get 4.3 centimeters. Now I look on the scale of the map, then I'll make a correlation. On the map, what is the scale? Okay, so one centimeter, maybe it's 2.4 kilometers. Then I'll make a calculation, then I'll know, oh, okay, so from if I have to physically go then from Takwa to Takrade, it's maybe 39 kilometers. Oh, okay. How do we know that it's 39 kilometers? It's the DME. So an aircraft that is moving from, say, Amsterdam. I like using Amsterdam, eh? Okay, let me let me, now let, permit me to use Heathrow. London. London Airport Heathrow. So an aircraft from London uh, Airport Heathrow to Accra is six hours. How do we know that the time is to take six hours? It is a round trip distance when the aircraft is flying to and from all the DMEs into an encounter on its road. That sums up to know that, oh, when I take off from Heathrow and I want to get to this DME, it is 50 minutes. From this DME to DME, one hour. From this DME to DME, um, 30 minutes. From this DME to this DME, and then everything will be calculated and we say, oh, then the estimated time of arrival is six hours. So when someone is moving, uh, is flying, and he's told that it will take four hours to get to your destination. Yes, it is four hours because they have calculated a round trip on the route they are going to use, which has been provided from the AMHS system. And out of that route, also factored into consideration the weather on the route whether they need to change the route or not. All is factored, and we say that your estimated time of arrival is six hours. So based on the rotator method, once I turn towards 120 degree, I know that if I move straight 38 kilometers, 120 degrees, I'll get to Takrade. So moving 120 degrees is a VOR function. 
Now, to move 38 kilometers to get to my destination is the DME function. I'm sure you've gotten the point, right? Good. So that's the function of the DME. So the VR DME is one, they are very important equipment because planes don't just move anyhow in the airspace. They move to and from the VR stations, getting its bearing, and then they also get to know how far they are to touch down. Again, the Enrouge DME also provides a distance about 370 kilometers, but for the terminal DME within 25 nautical miles, it's then the aircraft will be able to know how far they are to touch down at the threshold of the airport. And so, typically, an aircraft sends well, a signal to the DME, and that signal is sent to the DME, we call it interrogation because it's asking the DME. DME, DME, what's my distance? What's my distance? And DME will say, wait, is this signal correct? Yes. Then it processes it and it will reply the aircraft. And inside the aircraft here, it has a DME indicator. So the indicator in the DME will tell the pilot, your distance is uh, 93.5 nautical miles. Now this speed, this speed is a function from the so uh, from the surveillance system once you say not that is how fast it's going once you say not so in the aviation industry we use some uh, conventional distances that are not <laughs> normal uh, with uh, our engineers we are more used to meters uh, inches and stuff but uh, kilometers uh, miles but we use instead of saying kilometers we use nautical miles so if you want to know equivalent of nautical mass to mass, then you have to convert, I think, 0 0.845. Uh, one nautical mass is about 0 0.845 kilometers. Not so sure. But when you Google, you will know the relationship. So that is the explanation of DME as well. Let's now move to talk about another navigation system, the ILS. The ILS. So the ILS consists of two systems. We call the localizer and the glide. The localizer and the glide slope. Now, what does this do? Instrument landing system. From the name instrument, it means they are instruments. They provide landing aid for the aircraft. Now you see the antenna. You see the antenna, the antennas, and you see another antenna sitting in front of the other antennas. This antenna sitting in front, this single one is like a policeman. He's checking and monitoring all the signals that these other antennas are sending. And if any of the signals are, are not correct, this policeman here will report that, my friend, you are not working well. Let me call my master so that my master will tune you well. And of course, its master is the engineers, the air traffic engineers. So as a senior air traffic engineer, the navigational aids is my domain. It's my area of expertise, actually. So this keeps monitoring, monitoring. And if any of them is faulty, it will report to the air traffic engineers. And then we will calibrate and tune the signals. What does this um, system does. Again, the instrument landing system comprises of the localizer and the glide. So the localizer, so as you see in here, this antenna, um, those of you who knows Accra very well, if um, you are standing in front of Airwak Stadium and you're looking across the wall, you find some group of antennas behind, behind the wall. And the antennas are positioned such that the middle antenna is positioned exactly at the center of the runway. And our policeman is also positioned exactly at the center of the runway. So that the signals from the uh, localizer antenna, now on the left, the small line you are seeing there is the antennas. And the signal that this antennas combine, so a single antenna sends a signal but when you have the same antenna and you are able to combine two or more so that its combined output is one we say array of antennas 
and the resultant of the antennas forms a certain beam as you are seeing so the group of antenna forms this beam up to this point about 25 nautical miles for the localizer and then um, about 50 nautical miles for the clearance side so aircraft between from this side to this side can all be received so an aircraft that is coming towards the to land at the airport within 25 nautical miles when he tunes to the ILS you don't only get to the localizer you get the localizer you get the glide and as well as you get the um, the terminal DME the localizer emits a radio course signals for center guidance so that um i think some i think uh, someone has unmuted himself a picture with someone in a box if you can kindly put your video off or mute yourself we appreciate it. thank you so the localizer is a, emits a radio course signals onto the runway for center guidance so that aircraft will be able to touch down exactly at the center of the runway question why should aircraft land exactly at the center of the runway have you think about it i'll ask you at the end of the during the discussion to see if someone has an answer for it now as this localizer is giving center guidance for aircraft to land exactly at the center of the runway its brother called the glide slope is also giving vertical guidance and this is a typical um glide path antenna um installation setup Co the combination of these three antennas emits another radio call signal for vertical angle of three degrees so when an aircraft tuned to the ILS, he gets uh, within 10 nautical miles what angle, the correct angle for him to descend to touch down, he's guided to touch down exactly at the center of the runway. And at the same time, he knows how far he is to touch down at the threshold of the airport. I'm sure this is, has, is also clear, right? Good. So this is the automatic weather observation system, which is a fully configurable airport weather system that we say provide continuous real-time information and reports on airport weather conditions. So the hour stations are mostly operated, maintained, and of course con um, um, controlled by um, air traffic engineers. So depending on the configuration of the hour systems, we can measure so many parameters such as the barometric pressure. We can also measure the wind speed and wind ga gas. We can also measure the temperature and dew point around the aerodrome. We can also measure the visibility in hazy conditions. How clear. So pilots sometimes want to also know the visibility because they also need to see. We also get the sky conditions, the precipitation, even thunderstorms, even lightning, freezing conditions. All this has been integrated into the system at, uh, at, at a glance to the pilots so that they are able to uh, give this weather information to the pilots. One parameter that I know is very, very important is the uh, key onage, the barometric pressure. After the time this picture, I took this picture, the key on it is 1012. When he gives this barometric pressure to the pilot, he enters this into his aircraft altimeter. So that as he is landing, the, his altimeter in the aircraft will be changing. So that once his altimeter reads 1012, then the pilot knows that, oh, he's already on the ground. He's already touching down on the ground. So with this altimeter, if it is correct, whether the plane has a screen or not, the plane can still touch down. So, as for weather formation, so in fact, the controller you had communicating with the uh, um, pilot, he was giving him weather information. So, 
the pilot controller gives weather information to the pilot. And in the aircraft on the left, this is his uh, information, weather information. Question, should the pilot always be talking? Talking and be giving weather information to aircraft that are just passing their way or aircraft that are just coming? Yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. But in Accra, we have another system we call the ATIS, the Automatic Terminal Information Service. We put the weather information on this ATIS and we put it on, in our case, we put it, uh, in our case in Accra, we put it on the VOR frequency. So that when pilots tune that frequency, they are constantly getting audible audio messages, such as, uh, this is Kotoka International Airport. Stand by for weather information issued at 10 o'clock GMT. And then it will go on and be reading the weather. At 11.30 or 12, when the weather changes, it is updated and it will broadcast so that all aircrafts in our vicinity can get to hear the weather information. Another system we use in the navigation systems that you will find in Tapa is the NDB, non-directional beacon. They are installed on a route path that also gives bearing information to aircraft, but not like the VOR. And it also helps pilots to confirm whether they are on the right route of, this, uh, of uh, inbound or outbound of the active um, airfield or runway. So this is a typical installation of our systems in Accra. So the runway, as you see the runway, it's uh, the left side is labeled 2 1. That is the far end towards the Spintest Road. And the end label 0 3 is the end closer to Airwalk. Behind the runway is the localizer antenna that I mentioned to you about. That you see you airwalk is somewhere here. Now, this localizer antenna sends the signal so that aircrafts coming to touch down will get center guidance. At the right top of 2-1, you will see glide path and TDME. This glide path is here because aircraft wants to touch down somewhere here. So this glide path, uh, the TDME gives terminal distance to aircraft so that they will know that this is where they are supposed to touch down. Then the glide path is also here to give the angle for the place to touch down here so that they can now get here and taxi. Beyond the spin test road underpass, the VOR and route DME is also located here off the spin test road at East Legon. That gives bearing information, flight left, flight right indication on the pre-selected route, flight to and flight from indication, and then view the DME, we say, it gives a vertical slant distance information to aircraft on a pre-selected route. Again, the function of the DME, we say, it gives a vertical slant distance information to aircraft on a pre-selected route. And then, of course, our NDBs in our car, we can look C1 at a Chalibotre and another one at Cantonment. So when an aircraft take off, this one accountments confirms it the outbound route. And when aircrafts are getting to the airport, the one at Chalibotre confirms the inbound route to the pilots. Now, let's talk about the surveillance systems. Our surveillance systems, basically the primary, we talk about the, AT, the radar systems, the ATS systems, the ADSC systems, the ADSB system, the CPDLC systems, I have actually talked about the CPDLC anyway. Now, radar. Radar is an acronym for radio detection and ranging. And it's a detection system that uses radio waves to determine the distance or range or angle of velocity of objects. Take note. The radar determines the distance, the angle, and the velocity. It can be used to detect aircraft, shapes, spaceships, guided missiles, motor vehicles, weather formations, and terrain. So we say that um, we also say that a radar system consists 
of a transmitter producing electromagnetic waves as we are seeing on the screens in in the radio or my uh, microwaves domain and has a transmitting antenna it also has a receiving antenna which is often the same so the antenna for transmission and receiving is the same so an antenna that can transmit and receive at the same time we call a transceiver remember i mentioned to you that red radar is operates opposite to dme in the case of the dme it is the aircraft that wants to know his distance so it will send signal to ask the dme to know and the dme processes and reply to the aircraft but in the case of the radar it is the radar that wants to know what the aircraft aircraft where are you where are you so the radar will send an interrogation signal and it will hit the aircraft the aircraft processes and then the reflector signal come back to the radar and the radar processes and know that oh you are 3000 feet from the ground you are going at this speed 160 knots and you are this angle so those green green information you saw on the screen are as a result of the radar now on the screen that you saw in the controller working position is an integration of the atm system the air traffic management system that integrates all that integrates the radar the adsc the adsb and the cpdlc it integrates everything so that at the controller's desk just a, a single screen he sees all so on the screen is a typical atm installation and this is uh, one of the new uh, engineers employed as you are seeing he's um, doing some configurations on the atms on the atms and i think at this time he was doing a playback of a communication between a pilot and a controller so on the atm screen as you are seeing on the right typically integrates everything we talk about the radar and and so the, those so those lines okay so those black line black shaded portion is the our airspace um those lines you are seeing are the air routes the imaginal roads so on the road we we say we have physical roads aircraft to drive on but up in the skies we have logical roads and these logical roads are defined by installations of some ground systems so aircraft don't just take off and move anyhow in the open space they are guided through some fixed waypoints to move from one point to the other so these are some of the information that are processed in the air traffic management system integrating the ADSC, the ADSB, and the CPDLC. So, from the engine, air traffic engineer's point, at a glance, we see all the working positions of the controllers. So, um, for instance, the, on the server you saw, all these rack servers you saw here, are uh, these doors you see down, down on the line here. So here, from the the main server, uh, for the main uh, um, server control point from the engineering um, workbench position, we see whether in, any there is any problem. And the top, where you find these ash boxes, especially the top ash box, those boxes you are seeing at the top here are the controller working positions. If any of them has a problem, it will indicate yellow or red to indicate to us that there are problems there. They require attention. So, typically, on the screen, those lines, red lines you are seeing here, you are seeing on the screen, are all waypoints, logical waypoints. Those dots you are there, those green green you are seeing. Notice that you are seeing the the far right green you are seeing. It looks like there's a circle with a dot, the dot green in the middle. That is a typical aircraft. It's telling the how high the aircraft is, at what speed, and the registration of the aircraft, so that the controller doesn't get confused. Now let's watch a short video on the so how the surveillance systems are also working. Sorry.
So those dots, the dots you are seeing on the right is an X. Now look at it closely. It moves. If you look on the screen closely, look at the one one on the left. The one on the left, it's moving. It moves. The dots is moving. Now you see this one, the one on the far right, the information has changed. Do you see the uh, do you see a movement? Aha. Uh -huh. So they are actually moving, but on the screen they appear slow, but they are very fast. So the right, if the right screen you saw, you have just seen, is uh, uh, as a function of the integrated systems, of course. Other systems we have under surveillance, we can talk about the ADSC. The ADSC means is a means by which um, an An agreement will be established between the ground system and the aircraft through a data link that specifies the conditions for the plane when it connects to the system. How often? So with the ADSC, we give autonomy to the pilot to choose where he wants to go. But the condition is that at certain point intervals, you keep reporting your position. The ADSB also, it's uh, a new technology of the radar. By means, an aircraft will be automatically um, identified, its position noted, so that um, through a data link, we'll be able to know exactly where he also is. The CPDLC, that stands for the Controller Pilot data Link uh, Communication, Controller Pilot Data Link Communication, it's a means of communication between a controller and a pilot that also uses uh, the data link for communication. So with the CPDLC in conjunction with the high HF, the high frequency communication, the controllers communicate with the pilot by via text message. Via text message so that there is no ambiguity in communication. If pilot speaks or says something and uh, Controller says, ah, pardon, what are you saying? What are you saying? Because on the HF, there's so much grading noise. It means the pilot may not be able to execute the com commands that the controller is saying. So in, in resolving that ambiguity in conjunction with the HF, using the CPL DLC, the controller chats like using the, the WhatsApp to chat with the pilots. Now on the screen, it's a typical, um, it's a typical air route, a fly, a craft flight route designation. So if you look closely, So if you look closely, you see the map of Ghana. You see the map of Ghana, and now I'm just trying to. Um, just a second. Oh, sorry, it looks like the annotation is not working. I don't know why. I wanted to draw the outline. But looking closely, you see the map of Ghana. And going down, 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 down into the sea, you see a certain line here. It goes far, far, far to the right, and then to Sao Tome, and then it cuts across. So this is typically the air route of Accra um, or Ghana. And all those lines you are seeing here are air routes that you cannot see with your eyes, but they are there in the skies. Planes uses these routes. That is, so planes actually move on these routes. So, in, so our safety record have been very well because of something we call safety culture. So we know that in safety culture, everyone can make a mistake. And mistakes that are made should be reported. And when reported, mitigations and investigations 
are put in place and then corrections can be made. But when corrections are made, what do you do? We say that anybody can make a mistake, but only a fool or a company or individual makes the same mistake twice. So when mistakes are made, we make corrections, input it into a safety management um, um, system to have analysis of the data. Because without good data analysis, errors or mistakes are quite likely to be repeated later. So the trick is not only to gather the data of the mistakes that are being made, but to also have a program that will analyze and provide a clear picture for the problem. And when this is done, we provide safety nets so that such reoccurrences will not be prevented. So in the case of the picture that we saw, look at that aircraft. See this, uh, the, the engineers on the ground, after maintaining the aircraft, look, one of them left his torchlight. And the supervisor is asking, which of you take his stole my flashlight? But where is that torchlight? It's there. What do you think will happen? When the, it closes, it's going to cause a jam to the landing GS. Will he report after he forgot to put it here sincerely? Or will he keep it to himself? In our industry, and we don't we don't appreciate um, hiding such. We appreciate honest reporting for safety. Otherwise, such reckless behavior put people at risk. At this point, any questions? And remember, like the airline, it says that um, as Zoom airlines, their passengers are always right. So, in air traffic safety management, our reports from our systems are always right. We don't joke with it, we respond to it, and we always make sure our systems are up and running. At this point, um, we have about 20 minutes more to live in, and I think it's time to ask questions. So, please, friends, if any of you have a question, I'm sure this is the time to ask the question. But before we do that, let's turn our attention to the moderator to see if there are questions in the chat room that he can bring my attention to to answer that first. And then um, we, we can take the question from you, friends. Dr. Uh, Nafong. Um, Engineer Bachi Amaron. Um, Please, someone um, was trying to okay. ask a question, uh, but I think in your presentation you probably answered that, so I didn't jot that one down. Um, but most of the chats they are talking about is not being able to see or hear you, but I think it's their network issue. So if right. you have a question, you can raise your hand and I'll um you know and uh, i'll allow you ask uh, <clears throat> dog please i wanted to ask a question okay. please go ahead yes thank you so um Engineer, thank you so much uh, for this great insight. Uh, my question is that uh, in the case of lightning and thunder, do, do such things uh, influence your network? And what are in place maybe to handle such? Um, because I know that um, even in the bad way planes fly, and nobody can predict when there will be light in and fear with your system and how do you handle it to handle such events? Thank you. Dr. Anafong. Hello, Hello, Dr. Anafong. Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. I, I, I was hoping we would take a number of questions and then we can answer. Or if you um, want me to answer this, I can go ahead. Okay, um, uh, Matthew, if you are around, you can ask your question. Mm. 
Matthew Abari, if you're around, ask your question. Is there any other person with a question? So that we'll take a few and um, answer them. No other question. Okay, um, Engineer Bwache, I think- Please, if, if I'm allowed to ask again, <laughs> yeah, am I allowed to add a question? Please, okay, so I also wanted to know whether, please, I'm Dr. Aganjiva. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yes, so, uh, yes, sir. Please, I also wanted to know whether every runway has a dedicated, um, a set of antennas for it or uh, in other ways le okay let me put it this way how many runways do we have in kotoka and uh, 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 whether each runway has dedicated uh, 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 sort of uh, antennas and other communication system dedicated to it or it's a general one but it uh, uh, answers for uh, to, for each of the runways I don't know whether my question is clear. It's very clear. Um, last chance. Okay. Yes. Do we have let me add the last one, the third one. <laughs> I also have a question. Okay, me. So after HOD, you ask. Okay. Please, uh, my other question is this. Uh, I think you, sh you showed that there's, uh, you showed Ghana's air route, but uh, that one is deep information for me. I thought that the air routes are plenty. I thought maybe depending on where you are flying to, you, um, you will have a different air route, or does it mean there's only one air route for Ghana? That's also a, a question I wanted to clarify. Thank you. All right, me. All right, Doctor Nofo, if you permit me, let me address this once. Um, okay. All right. And then okay. we'll take. So there's a question also in the chat box, and I think uh, in answering um, the, the second question from Doctor Ganjiba will also address it. He says there is this thing I realize that aircraft always use one path, especially towards Accra Airport. Why is it always like that? Uh, per the example you were giving, drawing a point from uh, Takwa to Takradi. All right, so if you do remember, the earlier picture I showed at that airport is not in Kotoka. It had two runways, right? So that is a very busy airport. But Accra airport is not that busy and we have only one runway. So our runway uh, before a runway is designed, you should take into consideration so many things. Wind direction, wind speed, and you take all that into consideration before you know the orientation of the runway. So our runway could have been done, could have been designed facing towards Bemakam. But for some good reasons, it is designed between the spin test and towards um, the sea. Now, um, on our runway, it is, it is known that about 95% of the time in Ghana, the wind direction is always the same. And please, friends, planes always land in opposition to the direction of flow of the wind. So about 95% of the time, the wind is blowing from the sea towards inland. That is the reason why all the time you see planes landing from the sprinter side area towards um, um, towards the sea. Once a while, especially during Hamatan, when the wind direction changes, then you find planes, if you are in Osu, you find planes um, landing from Osu towards the, um, the airport. So the runways have, um, for instance, the localizer that Dr. Gajiba asks. If we have one installed at the end of 03, in fact, runway names, the ends, as you saw on the screen, one end was named 21. 
and one end was named 0, 3. The 21 and 0, 3 are conjugate angles. First, the 21 is uh, a runway uh, ends are always named in three, de in three degrees, but we always we may talk about two of them. So there's always a zero at the end. So in Kotoka, the 2, 1 end is actually the angle at which it's cutting the VOR. So when you fly on 210 degrees or 21, it will lead you exactly to the center of the runway. So for example, the navigation systems will always talk about the main function, but they have overlapping functions that we can employ of. So in the event where the localizer is 40, totally down, how can planes get center guidance? They can fly on the VOR 210 degrees. So the VOR we have in the DVOR we have in Accra serves for en route and terminal. It can guide aircraft to land at the airport and it can guide aircraft whilst they are passing their way. So because 95% of the time the wind direction is the same, the reason why we have only installed the localizer at only one end, because it is virtually negligible, even in the Hamatan, it's virtually negligible how often planes weaving land from um, Osu end towards uh, the uh, spin test end. That's the reason why in our case, we have installed only the ILS at only one side. Yes, in some airports where the wind, uh, the, the, the weather conditions are so rapid, keeps changing. Yes, it's advisable to install ILS at both ends of the runway. But I'm also happy to also let you know that we also have another system called PAPI, P-A-P-I, Precision Approach Path Indicator. Precision Approach Path Indicator. There are a group of lights that have been tuned such that even when aircraft are landing from Osu end towards the sprinter side, when the aircraft is flying within three degrees, the light indicates a certain, a, a certain set of lights. So the pilots know that, yes, this is my angle of descent. I'm sure that answered your second question about the runway uh, antennas and the ease design. Now the air routes, the air routes, yes, so uh, maybe it wasn't so clear. So the air routes, I only display to you only what we have in Accra. So from Accra serves as a hub, when planes take off, depending on where it is going. If you are going towards Nigeria, there's a route for you. You are going towards US, there's a route. You are going towards Europe, there's a route, but of course, there are also alternative routes. And this route is not contingent in only Accra. Togo has the S that enjoins Accra. Benin has the S that enjoins Togo. Nigeria has the S that enjoins. So these air routes are, they, they are not physical, they are logical. And it, these air routes have been extended so that when an aircraft that is going towards Europe takes off in Accra, for example, it follows, after exiting from Accra, it continues on towards Europe. Now you also ask about lightning and thunder. I'm also happy to let you know that all our system installations, the kind of earthing we do, is a combined earthing. Lightning and uh, earthing combined. For instance, the VOR station, for instance, we have lightning arrest test, lightning circuits. So periodically we have the lightning arrest test that we remove periodically. We, we test them and calibrate them. So the event of thunder, it, 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 it absorbs this thunder uh, strikes because it's a lightning and earthing, design earthing that we do. So it's taking care of our systems. So lightning cannot hit it. In the case of aircraft, lightning and thunder, in fact, weather is number one enemy in our industry. Most accidents that happens in the aviation industry happens either during la landing or takeoff. Because during landing, when the, wind, when the wind direction is so fast, when the wind shear is bad, when visibility is poor, it can easily cause an accident. Even en route, accidents rarely happens. Rarely happens. Unless there's a physical problem with the engines or something. But even that, in the case of thunder and lightning, which is an enemy, Aircraft, because of the electronics on board, when clouds are electrostatically charged, such as the cumulolumbus clouds, you know, that is causing thunder striking, aircraft logically will not pass through such um, clouds. It won't, it will dodge it. So I remember last week, uh, 26th of June, 26th of June, 
It rained the whole time in uh, Accra. I don't know about Takwa. And that was the first time since my 16 years working in the civil aviation, I saw and the approach controller's end. He was complaining that there was a problem with his 1195 frequency. And checks, so one, I, we went there, I told him, I, the simple question I asked him is that, does he have a DSCV in the house? He said yes. I asked him, when it is raining, is he able to continue watching DSCV? He says no. Then I asked him, have you looked at the clouds fully covered in your range? He said yes. Then I asked him, do you not get it? The reason why your frequency seems to be going on and off. Then he got the point. Because whilst communicating with the plane, the cloud serves as reflectors. So the signal is not going through straight to the plane. You see, it's not going straight to the plane. So he thought that the, 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 there's a problem with that um, transmitter, but there was not a problem. But of course, there are other alternative ways that we still communicate with them. So lightning, thundering, yes, happens in our industry, but they, we, we, we have a way around it. That is why if an aircraft is coming, say, from Amsterdam to Accra, ETA, six hours, and six hours means that it takes off two o'clock there, based on the two hours time difference, supposed to land in Accra at 7.30. 8.30, the aircraft hasn't landed. It may be possible it encountered bad weather on its original route. And once that is so, the controllers will guide the aircraft to change its route, and that will increase the time. So yes, it has an effect. I don't know whether Dr. Ganjiba, uh, I'm available to address your questions for you. So somebody also asked in the chat room, sir, please do the airplanes flight within the day or only some particular time and how the planes are monitored in sky in the night sometimes when they realize that the weather is not good. Well, I'm not so sure about your question, but if I am getting you, all aircrafts are also fitted with weather radar. They are fitted with weather radar. So the aircraft themselves can see the weather ahead of them. But then the ground systems are also, we have weather uh, uh, radars also that are able to also see the skies. So we advise them, and sometimes they themselves even tell the controller that they are requesting for alternative routes because they see clouds ahead of them. But we also see such clouds as well by means of our radar. So the radar also sees clouds as well. So once we see that, together with them, uh, the controllers with them, they are able to now um, advise them to change their routes or possibly to uh, uh, fly around the, this bad um, clouds. If there are further questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, Ni, you wanted to ask a question. Yes, sir. Um, my question was um, in the um, let's say the flying the aircraft industry, weather is the number one enemy. But then I was asking, what if there, there's a weather uh, reader that is used for detecting the weather? Or what if there's an unforeseen or like just uh, let me see a random storm, um, less like a, a snowstorm when you are traveling to those European countries, and there, there has to be some kind of it's an emergency. Is there like an emergency? Have they planned emergency landing sites along the coasts or yeah, along the the um, routes or something? And in case maybe they are flying over the sea and there there has to be an emergency landing, what what would they do? Thank you. So sometimes some of these clouds, bad clouds, are unavoidable. <laughs> the aircraft will fly through them. And when aircraft fly through bad weather, that is what we experience, what we call turbulence. Turbulence. It's as if you are driving on a road and you are, the road is so bumpy. So yes, it does that. Every country has um, accident and investigation or emergency procedures. So in Ghana, for instance, there is an emergency procedure. When aircrafts are coming, and the, in the case where, the, in the case of 26 June, the weather was so bad, I could recount as many as five aircraft that were encircling in our airspace, waiting for the weather to clear before they can come in. But uh, the, this decision will be made in conjunction with the pilot, especially 
how many people do you have on board, and most importantly, how much fuel do you have in the aircraft. If the fuel is not enough to let you encircle, then we will direct you to land at one of our emergency nearby airports. In the case of Accra, you can land in, um, in, in um, if, depending on the size of the aircraft, and now who is there? Kumasi is there, Sunyani is there, uh, even they can even go as far as Abidjan, um, Lomi. All these um, places, there is an established agreement with them for emergency. Remember, aircraft coming to Ghana and there's an emergency and you don't go through these procedures, you go and land the aircraft in Abidjan. Remember, it's a cost for the aircraft. They need to find a hotel for all the passengers on board, find food for all of them. So in order to avoid such costs, uh, if they have enough fuel, then you try to encircle him until he has the path um, to, to land. Otherwise, depending on the conditions, you can uh, direct him to all, any of the alternative designated um, airports. So depending on the amount of fuel which the pilot will tell the controller, they, uh, they will always know how much uh, the distance from where the aircraft is to the closest airport where they have to send him there to go and land. And in such cases, the aircraft that has that limited fuel has the priority to land. Someone asked in the chat room, does aircraft experience traffic like in the case of the road? Yes, please. It experiences traffic. In Accra, uh, we don't experience much. But in Europe, there's so much traffic. But good news is that there are systems, technological systems, that seamlessly and automatically schedule sequences this aircraft to tap. So, for instance, in some of the airports in Europe, aircraft, as one is coming to tap, another one is following, another one is following. But the controllers will sequence them at a certain time such that uh, they don't hit the, they don't hit each other. The moment you touch down, you move. As you are exiting to the taxi, another one is touching. You move in, another one is touching. Moving, another one is touching. A little space, another one is entering to take off. So, yes, it is true. Is it possible to experience head-on collision by two aircraft moving in opposite direction? Uh, my friend, the answer is, a, is, a, is a yes and no. By yes, about 2%. Uh, no, because it never happened. Aircraft are fitted on board a certain technology called TCAS. T-C-A-S. T-C-A-S. Um, it's a collision avoidance system. So, when... One aircraft is coming from the left. Another one is coming, flying at the same height. Can they hit head on? This aircraft will be notified that there's a current aircraft coming ahead of him. This aircraft will also be notified. But of course, the controller would have seen and separated them. But in case the controller is sick and he has collapsed at his desk, then the International Civil Aviation Protocol says that in that event, listen to what the t cars will tell you. The t cars will tell one of them to go down, will tell one of them to go up, or will tell this person to go right, or to tell this person to go left. And that is the order they are supposed to follow. I'm sure this answers your question. So about 99% of the time, aircraft doesn't hit head-on because there are systems in place that take care of that. Any further questions? I am engineer. And I don't know whether you Yes, please. I have um, one question, not two. So I know in okay. Australia, like um, there are times in the night that a plane is not allowed to land. Do we have such a case in uh, Ghana? And the other thing I noticed is, um, I think some time back in Australia, a plane took off and um, I think there was an issue. It needed to land back at that same airport and they made it circulate around for some hours before it landed. Um, if such a thing happened, is it because they wanted to burn some fuel or why would that happen in the circulation? Yes. So let me start from your last question. So it depends on the type of aircraft. You know, aviation fuel is expensive, right? So imagine that aircraft is a passenger aircraft. So it means he may have about over 250 to 400 passengers on board and they are baggages. And the aircraft is also full. So remember, accidents usually happen during landing and takeoff. So depending on the problem they realize, sometimes they encircle to burn fuel, or sometimes they are made to fly towards the sea and spill off some fuel. 
so that when the aircraft is touching down, probably the problem they encountered might be a landing gear. When the aircraft was taking off and was closing the landing gear, he realized that the, the, the tires could not enter. So such in, in such cases, he has to land an emergency. So in landing on emergency, there's a possibility that, uh, you know, the, because it cannot go, it, it hits the ground, it will break. And when it breaks, the aircraft part will touch the ground and scratch. The fire rescue people will be there to quench it, but you know it can catch fire. But when there's less fuel, less fire. More fuel, more fire. So yes, it can spill off some of this fuel or move around to burn some of the fuel. Aircraft burn most of their fuel during climbing. When you are climbing a hill and descending a hill, which do you burn more energy? I'm sure climbing up, right? So aircraft burn most of their fuel during takeoff. But when they take off, they climb to their, 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 their cruising height. At that place, they burn less fuel and descending less fuel. But in climbing, that is when burn most of their fuel. Again, um, yes, in Ghana, especially in Tamale, <laughs> it happens a lot. And in Kumasi also, Kumasi for some funny reasons in the mornings has low ceiling clouds has low ceiling clouds so the type of aircrafts in ghana and especially i know about african world they have their own internal protocol in the event of bad weather although we have automated systems like the ils that will automatically land the aircraft because yes some of the aircrafts can land automatically without the intervention of a uh, pilot in such cases we say the autopilot autopilot so in Kumasi, Tamale, Accra, we have state-of-the-art systems all installed for automatic. But the RVR, the runway visual range, visibility can be very poor in Tamale and Kumasi. And especially in Kumasi, when the clouds are low, low ceiling, or uh, in vents where it's rained very, very heavy, uh, clouds are thick, African world have a protocol they won't take off. Although when they take off, there are systems to automatically help them to learn. So, yes, sometimes it does happen. And when it does happen, they will have to wait until the clouds are clear before they will take off. That one is a protocol by African world. But sometimes also the clouds can be very, very poor such that although you have automatic system to help you learn, flying through it, you the pilot cannot see clearly. So, yes, sometimes the pilot, uh, control, air traffic control will advise them to stay on the ground until the weather is clear. Another question in the chat room is what will happen in the future to human resources in the process of emerging artificial intelligence? My friend, artificial intelligence vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, uh, blockchain has been with aviation industry for so long a time. It will interest you to know that the aviation industry is one single place where all, all kinds of engineering is practiced under one umbrella. So someone who touch, who um, uh, buys an air ticket, who wants to even go and check in at the airport nowadays, you find no human person there. You, the passenger, will check in yourself. And your, all your information, everything is there. It's all about AI. So AI has been with us and it will continue to be with us. And all the emerging technologies in blockchain advantages have been employed here. Maybe in future I might give a, a, a lecture on blockchain um, technology in the aviation industry and you appreciate this furthermore so they are always with us and one of its effects is that nowadays when you are checking in in some of the airports you don't find a physical person you put your own you put your own luggage on the scale if you overweight <laughs> you can't check in if it's weight is within limit it will give you the tag then you place the tag and when you put your tag your tag sticker on your bag and you put on the conveyor uh, uh, for where your bag is going you don't know but at your destination you will go and meet your back. It's all because of AI. Even your, your boarding pass automatically will print it to you. There's no human being there. It's all because of AI. So what will happen in the future? Human resource. Um, um, human resource may reduce, but um, what can we do? Uh, to get to a point, the AI may even eliminate lectures, physically lecturing students. I'm sure you agree with me on that as well so ai is here with us and its advantages we are all having experience in it as well as its effects 
I think it's 11 7 of entered into their time. So, um, Dr. Nufon, um, over to you. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting us know about the aviation system. Um, I'm sure you'll come back before we wrap it up when we are about closing. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I'm here. All right. So I've taken so, my time the whole day, and I'm glad to share the whole day time with my friends here. Okay. So our next presenter 